I've talked about the music and the battle system, and I've said they're both amazing. But now we're going to talk about exploration, and here is where the review turns negative. You will see that there are flaws that are definitely considered small by many, but they've made this game very difficult for me to enjoy researching. Let me run you through the table of contents. One, mini games. Two, side quests. Three, general level design and linearity. Four, invisible walls. Five, interruptions. And six, treasure chests and shopping. So let's talk about mini games. There are 10 mini games in FF7 Remake. Darts, The Motorcycle Ride, The Switch Throwing Game, Whack a Box, The Robot Arm Puzzles, Squats, Pull Ups, A Dance Performance, The Water Pump Game in the Sewer, and The Monkey Bar Section. All the games tell you how to play them just fine. No problem there. Darts, Whack a Box, Squats, and Pull Ups have first, second, and third place prizes. If you get first place, you get all three prizes. Excellent call. I can't begin to tell you how annoying it is to play a game with trophies for beating the game on each difficulty setting, and even if you've beaten it on the hardest setting, you still have to go back and beat it on the easier modes as well. That is so stupid. So thank you for that one. The only problem here is how boring some of these games can be. Now I know that boring is a subjective term, but let me give you some reasons. In the switch throwing game, you literally listen to Tifa count down three, two, one, and push the button. That's it. It's not that long, so it's not much of an offender, and they add entertainment value by having the characters act overly happy when they succeed at performing this extremely simple task. How about the mechanical arm puzzles? They move pretty slowly, don't they? Their movement speed is part of the problem, but worse is that you can't move the arms diagonally. You have to move horizontally and then vertically. Of course, puzzles always take the longest the first time you try them, and it's going to be different for each person. But once you have it memorized, if you solve the puzzle with near perfect movement, the first one takes 45 seconds, the second one takes a minute 20, and the last one takes 2 minutes and 20 seconds. That's a total of 4 minutes and 25 seconds of just watching robot arms move around if you know exactly what to do and forego obtaining the optional materia, which you don't want to do because one of them is the magnify materia, one of the most useful materia in the game. And since most reviewers played the game just once before writing their review, it's easy to see why everybody goes out of their way to mention how slow the robot arm puzzles are. The most boring minigame must be the bike ride section. I want to say that Square Enix also thinks the bike game is boring because one of the rewards for beating the final boss is the option to completely skip the bike section in future playthroughs. Cloud is riding a motorcycle straight forward into the Z-axis of the screen, steering with one hand and holding his sword, which is larger than the bike, in the other to slash down enemy bikers and drones. Don't ask me how it works, guys. At the end is an elite biker named Roche who acts as a boss battle. Sounds fun, right? Well, it's not. For starters, there is almost no challenge. Crashing into other bikers or scraping against the wall has no consequences. Enemy bikers and Roche attack you, but you can take 52 hits before you die. A bigger problem is the limited move set. You have a normal attack and a special attack. That's it. The special attack has a long range and a short range version. So three things you can do, I guess. The special attack uses a gauge that very slowly refills, but it will instantly refill if you drive over one of the several ramps on the highway. A good portion of the ride involves waiting for out of range bikers to slow down so you can drive up next to them and slash them three times. Boring. And you have to do this for a good long while. The current world record speedrunner of this game is a guy named Borin. That's right, his name is Borin. I'm not joking. Borin can complete this Borin minigame in 7 minutes 45 seconds. There are a couple of challenges you can do if you feel so inclined. 
Trying to kill multiple enemies with a single long-range special is pretty hard. Also, if you finish with over 80% health remaining, Jesse will kiss you. Not a bad reward, but moving just left and right while waiting for people to get within slashing range for 8 minutes is objectively boring gameplay. We're moving on to the topic of side quests now. I've completely deleted and rewritten this section twice as I try to figure out a way to explain what's good and what's bad about these quests. The previous version of this section had me detailing everything you do in every quest. I even recorded that script and then decided that it might be boring and so now I'm redoing it yet again. <sighs> I made this chart which contains all information relevant to the side quests. Let's just go through it together. Let's look at the light blue box first. There are 24 quests total in the game if you exclude Chadley and Moogle Merchant. These five items in the light blue box are every possible praise you can give in FF7 Remake side quest. The quest has direct story relevance or character development. Sorry, but information about Mire and Kirie doesn't count. Those two people don't have anything to do with the story of FF7 Remake. The quest unlocks a new area. The quest has new mechanics or a new use for old mechanics. The quest features an enemy unique to that quest. The quest is challenging in some way. How important these things are will depend on the player. Some people can't stand the thought of doing anything too detached from the main narrative. Some people don't mind fetch quests. Some people just like completing side quests for the sake of checking off all the items on their to-do list. And some people will do anything if they think the reward is worth it. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to avoid talking about quest rewards until later. Only one quest has any story relevance. Kids on patrol. We find out that Biggs started the orphanage in Sector 5. Woo Only one quest takes place in a new area. Nuisance in the factory. It unlocks the Talager factory. Only three quests have new mechanics. Whack-a-box, squats, and pull-ups. Keep in mind that praising a quest for having new mechanics says nothing about whether those new mechanics are well designed. I'm giving points for the gameplay simply being something new. 15 quests have enemies unique to that quest. 17 of the quests involve overcoming a challenge of some type. Most of those are mini bosses. Now let's just assume that all combat in FF7 Remake is well designed because nearly all of it is. From a purely gameplay perspective, if you have a challenging battle like a mini boss in your side quest, you've already got a side quest that quote unquote works. And FF7 Remake shines in this area. The majority of side quests have well-designed mini boss encounters included in them. So that takes care of that. Most of the side quests are good. Well, not exactly. A lot of these come coupled with a lot of dialogue, travel time, and fetch quests. Let's get the easy part out of the way. Fetch quests are considered the lowest tier of side quests in RPGs. They are often overly mundane requests like exterminate the rats in my house, or find my cats, find my kids, or teach me how to program my VCR. Hey game companies! When you sell us a game in which we are a swordsman in a fantasy setting taking on the world, and you market it as a swordsman in a fantasy setting taking on the world, we paid our hard-earned money to be a swordsman who takes on the world, not the guy who offers to change his neighbor's water filter for a small fee. Fetch quests also usually involve walking across previously traversed areas, making them objectively less interesting than going into the next new location. They usually aren't related to the story in any meaningful way, and they usually are void of any challenge and require very little engagement from the player to complete. They usually consist of walking somewhere, pressing the triangle button, walking back to the quest giver, and pressing the triangle button again. No thought or care required. So this means that any quest that is 
half fetch quest, half mini boss, is half bad, half good, objectively. So kids on patrol, you blew it. You could have been a solid side quest, but you messed it all up by having a search for five kids before we go and kill the Toad King. This game has seven quests that could be officially considered fetch quests, but it's way worse than it sounds because the number of items you have to fetch is far more than seven. Three cats, five kids, three chocobos, three compact discs, two medicine ingredients, three tiaras, and I don't remember how many items we fetched to get Cloud a nicer dress, but the number of trips you had to make for that quest was 11. That's a grand total of 30 fetch trips. That is too many motherfucking fetch trips. Now what about dialogue and travel time? This is a hardcore question right here. It's understandable that there is a person who wants us to kill a monster and we have to talk to them and then run out to the place where the monster is and do the job. But how much is too much? Dudes, I don't know the answer to this question. But I do know that whatever the answer is, Final Fantasy VII Remake crosses the goddamn line. What I am about to show you is the proof that these side quests are the definition of filler content. The definition! It's in the dictionary. Under the entry, filler content, it says FF7 Remake side quests. Are you ready for this? I'm about to show you how long it takes to complete each quest. If you listen to all of the dialogue, know exactly where to go and how to beat the enemies. That means you can reduce this time by some amount if you skip all the dialogue. But this also eliminates any search time and time being lost. Then I'm going to show you how much of that time is spent in battle. To complete, all of the side quests takes nearly eight hours. Of those eight hours, the amount of time spent in battle is about 35 minutes. There you have it. Seven hours and a half of filler content justified by 35 minutes of quality battles. I don't think I need to say anything more. FF7 Remake, you crossed the line. We're talking level design now. I don't have much to say about the towns, just the dungeons. After my first few playthroughs, I wanted to simply say that the dungeons are linear. But then I decided to more carefully research it by plotting out all the ways you can go through most of the largest and most complex dungeons. This research has led me to the conclusion that the dungeons are linear. Even more linear than I first realized. If you weren't taking notes, didn't try to go everywhere, or haven't memorized the dungeons, after your first playthrough, you might say to yourself, yeah, I had to use the map to navigate my way across a complex series of catwalks to get that elemental material. Or, there were a lot of ways I didn't check in the drum. Well, I plotted out everywhere you can go in the drum, expecting it to be one hell of a non-linear maze of walkways, switches, and locked doors. But I was wrong. When you're controlling Tifa and Aerith, there's a place where you can either go downstairs or up a ladder. If you go up the ladder, it quickly leads to a dead end. That is the extent of non-linearity in this dungeon, and it perfectly illustrates the level design ethos of the entire game. When you climb up to the plate in Chapter 15, you can go up the ladder or across to the platform. Go across for a dead end with a chest. Then you can proceed by climbing the ladder. Here you can go into the building or around the building. Go around for a dead end with a chest, then go inside. Here you can take the rope or the stairs. The rope leads to a dead end with a chest. Then you gotta take the stairs. Are you seeing a pattern here? Nearly all dungeon exploration in this game consists of finding two paths, choosing one and either finding a dead end with a chest or proceeding further into the dungeon. Do you need some more examples? In the train graveyard, we can go into the train cart or take the ladder. Here, we can go into the train cart or up another ladder. 
déjà vu. In the maintenance facility, you might think there are four ways you can go here. All right, it's time for some exploration. I can go into that room. I can press the switch. I can go downstairs, or I can go across to that other room. Try the room closest to you. The door is locked. Try the switch. It doesn't do anything. Now I'm back down to just two paths. And guess what? One of them is a dead end with a chest. That was some short-lived exploration, wasn't it? Here, you can go up to that room or downstairs, and the room is locked. In the beginning of the catwalk dungeon, you can either go up to the sun lamp, go through a door, or go to a room behind you. The sun lamp is a dead end, and the door is locked, and they tell you that we need to go to that room. At platform G5, you can see a materia over on H7. It's cool that you can see it before you get it. Now we just have to do some exploration to figure out how to get it. From here, we can only go across to G8 or upstairs. G8 is a dead end with a chest. When you get here, you'll find two deactivated small cargo elevators. Dude, that's four things to explore. Two elevators, how to get the blue materia, and how to get the red materia behind the fan. This is the most complexity and exploration in the entire game. So let's see how it pans out. For now, there is only one available path we can take. When we get here, we can either use the console to create two paths or go up to the lamp, which we have to turn off anyway. And it's a dead end with a chest. Of the two paths remaining, the one on the right is a dead end with a chest. When you eventually arrive back at H2, you can either go upstairs or across to H1. But upstairs just loops back to the catwalk console. So there's a nice bit of interconnecting pathways for you. But that means there's just one path to take. On H1, you can ride a platform to H5 or go back and ride one of the small elevators. This elevator leads you to a series of rooms, a battle with a time limit, and eventually behind the fans to get that red materia. Now that was a solid bit of exploration. I realize that in the end, it's the same as a dead end with a chest, but this is better than all those other times because the path to the dead end was very long. There was the timed battle, which is new. There is the novelty of the path leading to the backside of the fan, which you got to see earlier from the outside, and the reward was better than anything you'll ever find in a chest. And there it is, my friends, the greatest piece of exploration in the entire game. As you can see, the exploration in this game is all about choosing one of two paths. One of them will almost always lead to a swift dead end with a chest, and then you'll immediately be back on the critical path. There are very few instances of having more than two paths to choose from, and when there are, dead ends and locked doors will reduce your options quickly. You can say objectively that the level designs are completely linear and the exploration is not very involved. There are never two routes to the same objective. There are no puzzles to solve, no environmental dangers to avoid, no dropping down from above floors to land on otherwise inaccessible areas below, no tools to use, and no jumping onto things. The only exploration you can do is looking around corners for chests. So if we are going on the basis that more complexity and exploration is the better level design, then yes, the level design is bad on those fronts. There are some positives in level design though. There are some areas that have you going through previously visited rooms on a previously inaccessible path. In the train maintenance facility, this train is blocking your way forward and later you run across the top of it. In chapter two, when you get here, you can see the beginning of the level on the other side of some rubble. Things like that are considered good because it creates a sense of continuity and therefore makes areas more realistic and more immersive. The drum is set up so that two parties can work together opening doors for each other to progress through the dungeon. Its design is still linear, but that is still more complexity than if you didn't have to do that. Another plus is that the dungeons create paths with appropriate barriers. We got cars and stuff in the parking lot, train cars in the train yard, ladders that you can't get back up to, uh, air, more air, what the? Oh, for the love of Mozart, look at this path. It is begging to be explored. 
All the invisible walls in this game are the worst. Invisible walls are considered a flaw because they are the least elegant way of keeping the player in the intended traversable area. They look ridiculous. You have no way of knowing where they are until you bump into them. They lessen immersion and they just create disappointment. But the ones in FF7 Remake are even worse than normal. Not only do they prevent you from going where you want to go, they also interrupt gameplay in the most time-consuming way possible. Before you reach the barrier, you'll be forced to walk slowly. Then when you reach the barrier, the camera swings around to look behind you and you get lectured and you have to watch Cloud slowly turn around and move away from the barrier. It's easily avoidable upon future playthroughs, but it's the worst method of keeping you in the contained area. And it is just another thing that makes the exploration worse, along with the overly linear level design and interruptions. The next thing I want to talk about is interruptions. I'm going to bust out my opinions on you guys now. The amount of interruptions is what makes me dread playing this game. I love the combat, the characters, the graphics, the setting, the music, and the customization through the materia system. That is nearly everything that matters in a JRPG. How do you get that many big things right and still make me hate your game? You do it by interrupting the gameplay all the goddamn time. You have to inch between obstacles. You have to walk when you'd rather run. You have to sit through three to five second loading times whenever you skip a cutscene. You have to watch all the unskippable cutscenes. And you have to sit there and charge up a gauge before you can flip all these mineral deficiency inducing switches. Are all AAA cinematic games like this? If they are, this is a flaw inherent to the genre because video games are meant to be played. FF7 Remake is a prime example of what professional reviewers would say is good cutscene pacing and what I would say is terrible cutscene distribution. Pacing is not the correct word here, so I'm coining the phrase cutscene distribution. A good cutscene distribution is one that doesn't interrupt you. Briefings before a mission, cutscenes at the end of a mission, things like that work well. So if the mission is to run through the subway tunnels, beat a boss, go through the catwalk dungeon, turning off a bunch of sun lamps, then go through Mako Reactor 5 and finally beat another boss, good places to have cutscenes would be before the mission so they can tell you what you're going to do, before the first boss so you can explore the subway tunnels uninterrupted and hype up the boss fight, after the boss, after you reach the end of the catwalk dungeon so you can explore it uninterrupted, before Airbuster, and after Airbuster. That's plenty of places to put cutscenes. There are only two types of gameplay in these dungeons, exploration and battle. Why do I need three cutscenes of Heidegger scolding his employees, interrupting my exploration of the tunnels? Why do I have to stop and have a conversation about where I'm gonna go next in a dungeon where the only path will lead me there anyway? Why can't they just talk while I'm walking? Why do I have to stop and press a button before I can enter every door in Reactor 5? Am I playing the game or watching the game? The less times things are explained to the player in cutscenes, the more things they'll have to figure out on their own and the more they'll be playing the game. Nobody needs to watch Cloud get out of bed, control him to walk literally 10 steps and lose control again to watch him talk tomorrow. Are you ready for some numbers? In chapter five, the subway tunnel, there are nine skippable cutscenes, six unskippable scenes, five times that you are forced to walk slowly and one instance of inching between obstacles. The total time of these interruptions only comes to two and a half minutes, but in a dungeon that's less than an hour long, why does my mission need to be interrupted 21 times? That is excessive. Chapter 6 comes in with similar numbers with a total of 20 interruptions for 3 minutes and 11 seconds of waiting for things to finish happening even if you skip all the skippable ones. And that's not counting the 3 to 5 second loading times when you skip the cutscenes. 
Mako Reactor 5, 30 interruptions, 15 of which are unskippable. I didn't time this chapter, but you know it's going to be pretty long when you have 15 unskippable cutscenes. Chapter 9, which has the collapsed expressway dungeon, has 42 interruptions. Why can't they consolidate these cutscenes a little? The drum dungeon has 52 interruptions in an hour-long dungeon. Now, 14 of those are just switches that you throw, but I count them because you can't just walk up, press the button, and move on. You have to sit there and build up a gauge for no reason. Total interruption time is eight minutes. Chapter four, which is a combination of the bike ride, a town, cutscenes, and a gauntlet, has 44 interruptions for a total of eight minutes. <clears throat> now, what about side quest chapters. <laughs> Chapter 3 oh, no, no, no. has 53 interruptions no. <laughs> for a total time of 14 minutes <laughs> and that's without doing any side quests. <laughs> Chapter 8 has 30 interruptions for a time of about 16 minutes without doing any side quests and skipping all the cutscenes. Can you imagine skipping all the cutscenes and the vast majority of the available content in a chapter and still having control taken from you for 16 minutes? That is a massive flaw of the gameplay, one that I view as fatal to the experience. We've talked about the whole dead end with a chest syndrome. Now let's talk about what's in those chests, along with the Shinra crates, materia you can find, and items you can buy in shops. I love talking about otaku stuff like this. Let's start with the Shinra crates. These crates can be found throughout the game, and when you break them, you receive randomly generated items from them. Healing items, Mako Shards, and Moogle Medals. Moogle Medals are medals you collect and use as currency at the Moogle Shop. You can buy several unique pieces of equipment and weapon SP manuscripts. So the Moogle Medals definitely have value. The Mako Shards are not items that go into your inventory, they just restore 10% of your max MP and disappear. This could be a real lifesaver if you didn't also receive a full MP restore upon resting on benches and after finishing each chapter. And if some treasure chests didn't contain ethers, and if you couldn't buy them from vending machines starting from chapter 8, there are just too many sources of MP for anyone to ever be thankful they found a Mako Shard. Lastly, the healing items you can find include potions, high potions, phoenix down, antidotes, echo mists, and remedies. You can buy all of these things except for remedies, which you can buy from chapter 13 onward. So the Shinra crates are really Shitra crates. In normal mode, the Mako Shards effect is too minuscule to affect your situation. Most of the healing items are often dropped by enemies and found in chests, and this abundance removes the need to buy them from shops, devaluing the entire shopping experience and their availability in shops in the first place devalues finding them in the Shinra crates. So in normal mode, the only thing worth finding in Shinra crates is the Moogle medal. In hard mode, however, Mako shards become almost the sole method of restoring MP. For some reason though, these crates still give you healing items in hard mode, even though you can never use them. That's a dick move. Materia. The bulk of the materia you'll need is available from Chadley by doing all of his challenges. 
His challenges are all things you would do normally in battle, such as staggering and assessing enemies. So most of your materia needs take care of themselves. You just need the money to buy them. Some materia are minigame and coliseum rewards. The rest of them are found in dungeons, and although a few of them require some work to obtain, all of them are plainly visible from the critical path. Deadly Dodge is just laying on the ground right here. You can't miss it. There's a healing materia sitting on this seat in the train. That must have fallen out of someone's pocket. This revival materia, which lets me bring people back from the dead, is just sitting right here on the path. All these materia can eventually be purchased at shops. The only materia that require exploration to get are the two elemental materia, Magnify, which involves doing a robotic arm puzzle, the two warding materia found in the sewers and the underground test site, Chocomog, and the two magic ups. All the rest you can get from Chadley, shops, or minigames. That means you are only rewarded for exploration with materia eight times in the game. The value of those eight materia will depend on whether or not you plan to use them. Shopping! Shopping in this game is treated more like a safety measure than anything else. If you miss a lot of things by not opening some chests, not winning minigames, or not doing side quests, you can find some of them in shops later. The best example of this is the Nail Bat. It's a one-of-a-kind weapon for Cloud that you have to do a side quest to obtain. It's a good thing Cloud was having a special sale on Toad King jobs. Otherwise, we would have never been able to get the Nail Bat. Or so I thought. I later found out that you can just buy the Nail Bat at Wall Market in Chapter 13. Now that is a lot later, so if you want to make Cloud a critical hit build right away, you'll want to do the side quest for it. There are several other pieces of equipment like this in the game, so right off the bat, the value of shopping will be less for people who like opening treasure chests and doing quests. A positive aspect to treating shops like this would be that there are less permanently missable items, but that positive aspect is not present here because once you beat the game, you can go back and replay any chapter you want. So collectors who want to get everything wouldn't have to replay the entire game from scratch anyway. There are equipment shops, materia shops, and item shops. Let's start with the materia shops. Materia are all supremely useful and add to the character customization and experimentation. So materia shops ought to be the greatest shops in the game. Chadley's shop is the main materia shop in the game. Most of the materia sold there are not available anywhere else. And his shop is therefore the greatest shopping experience in the game. The other materia shops are total crap. There are no materia found only in regular materia shops. These shops are only there for people who want more copies of materia they already have or if they missed one. The item shops sell lots of healing and status recovery items. A lot of the items you can buy here are provided by Shinra crates and dropped by enemies. There are also vending machines which are item shops in dungeons. There is also the fact that healing and remedy items are emergency items. You only buy them just in case. Most players will have a pool of unused healing items by the time they finish the game. So item shops are superfluous. The items they sell are obtainable from a vast number of sources and their value gradually decreases as you get better at the game. And they have absolutely zero value in hard mode where you can never use items. Terrible shopping to be sure. It says a lot about the quality of a shop when its most desirable item is a compact disc. So we have one good shop in Chadley's Materia Shop, and all the rest of the shops discussed so far are terrible. All that remain are the equipment shops. This game's equipment progression is not like the usual JRPG. You don't get all new, better equipment with every new town. This game's equipment is designed to accommodate builds, so the value of each piece of equipment depends on the person. If you think you'll want to try every build, or want to collect all the equipment because you just can't help yourself, the equipment for sale will be more valuable to you. I'm going to judge each piece of equipment that is on sale from the perspective of the player who wants to try many different builds and therefore wants to have 
one of each piece of equipment in the game. This is the most likely perspective for a new player since they don't know what's available in the game yet. This is also likely the most charitable perspective because if you go into the game with a build in mind, all equipment not included in your build can automatically be judged as useless and therefore bad. I'm also judging from the perspective of a player who does open chests in dungeons and who does do side quests. That's the thing about comparing the shop items to the chest items to the side quest rewards. They all devalue each other to some degree. Why do the side quest if you can just buy it? Why buy it if you can just find it in a chest? Why find it in a chest if you'll get it from the side quests? To maximize the value of chests, shops, and quest rewards, they should all be unique. In FF7 Remake, one of them will become very valuable if you don't do the other two. Anyway, here is what you can buy in Chapter 3. Iron Bangle, Star Bracelet, Power Wrist Guards, Bulletproof Vest, Earrings, Talisman, and Revival Earrings. You already found an Iron Bangle in Chapter 2, and Barrett starts with one. You get a Star Bracelet from a quest in this chapter. You found Power Wrist Guards in Chapter 2. You'll find a Bulletproof Vest later, but it will be a while, so this item has value now. Earrings are purchasable at any vending machine from this point on, but this is the first appearance, so this item has value as well. The talisman is available in a chest way late in the game when you'd never want to use it for some reason, but this is the first appearance, so it's not bad. The revival earrings are also available for the first time here. So chapter three shop is three out of seven total crap. Also, three of the four non-crap items will become obsolete later in the game. So overall, not a great shop. On to the chapter eight weapon shop. You can buy a leather bracer, mesmeric armlet, titanium bangle, collisionous bracelet, a star pendant, and a bunch of accessories that were available in chapter three shop. No need to consider those. So only five items to judge. You found a leather bracer in the train tunnels. You found a mesmeric armlet in the catwalk dungeon. You got a titanium bangle from Airbuster, and you can find a collisionous bracelet in a chest on your way to this town. The star pendant is new, so that's one item that isn't utter crapola. On to the chapter nine shop in Wall Market. The new items for sale are the hard edge, studded bracer, mithril armlet, gothic bangle, magician's bracelet, heavy duty bracer, Gothic Bangle, Sorcerer's Armlet, and Time Worn Talisman are all new. And the Supernatural Wrist Guard Survival Vest, Platinum Earrings, and Headband are all unique to this specific shop. And that, my friends, is how you have a good shopping experience. You have useful items that are not one use only that you can't get anywhere else. So that's only two bad items out of 12. Nice! There's a weapon shop in that little park on the way to the wall market that a guy sets up in chapter 13. It only sells one new item. It's the Big Bertha weapon for Barrett. It's the first time you can get it, so it's good, I guess. It's only one weapon, so it's more like a singular hidden item to find than it is a shopping experience. The last weapon shop in the game is in the Shinra building. It sells all the weapons you could have gotten earlier in case you missed them. I personally like having the option to buy stuff I missed earlier in the game, but upon removing my emotions from the analysis, all of these weapons would have greater rarity and therefore greater value if you could not simply buy them. There are four armor pieces as well. The Cog Bangle, Geometric Bracelet, Supreme Bracer, and Rune Armlet. You already have a Cog Bangle from the Valkyrie boss fight. The Supreme Bracer and the Rune Armlet are both winnable in the Shinra combat simulator. The geometric bracelet is the only one that is both new and can't be obtained through other means in the same chapter. So equipment shops overall. Chapter three, 50-50. Chapter eight, bad. Chapter nine, good. Chapter 13, not enough content to judge as a shopping experience. Chapter 14, bad. All item shops, bad. All materia shops, bad. Chad Lee's shop, good. Moogle Emporium, good. I forgot to mention Moogle Emporium. Nearly every item on sale is completely unique to that shop. So that comes to only three good shops in the game. Chad Lee's, Mog's, 
Wall Market. Sucky. Chest Contents. In nearly every JRPG I have played, the chests are bad. How many times have I said that nobody has ever been happy that they found a potion in a chest? This game is pretty high on the list of crappy treasure chests. In chapter one, there are 10 chests or things that hold items that you can loot. They aren't actually chests. Potion times two, grenade times two, ether, potion times two, phoenix down, potion times two, ether, phoenix down, ether, potion times two. These are all terrible chest contents, objectively. For the same reasons you've already heard a million times. You don't need these because you can get these items from shops and shinder crates and enemies. They are one use items. You use them once and they are gone. They become less valuable with every playthrough as players get good. And nobody has ever been happy. They found a potion in a chest ever. Not even one person in the entire world. It has never happened. The grenades are no more effective than your sword in chapter one battles. So this isn't the place to have those either. Chapter two has 12 chests. Potion times two, ether, 50 gil, potion times three, high potion, ether, high potion, 100 gil, grenade times two, grenade times three, power wrist guards, iron bangle. Six are healing items, crap. Two are gil, 150 gil total. How useful is 150 gil from chests? What can you buy? You can buy a compact disc of the Prelude and two potions. Or you could buy half a Phoenix down. Yay. That's two more letdowns. We got two more chests with grenades. You know what would make the grenade chest better? Instead of having two and three grenades in each chest, put all five in one chest. It's better to have one good chest than two mediocre ones. The last two chests are power wrist guards and an iron bangle. The only two chests in this chapter out of 12 that will actually please anyone. The remainder of this section is going to go very quickly and smoothly from this point forward. We have established that healing items and small amounts of gill are just bad chest contents. Equipment chests are good. The equipment found in them can be used for a period of time instead of just once in emergency situations. They make your character stronger or different in all battles until you change equipment again. In chapter three, zero of eight chests have equipment. They are all gill or one use items. Same with chapter four, zero out of one. In chapter five, two of the eight chests have equipment. In chapter six, one out of 11. Moogle medals can be found in Shinra crates and you can't use them until you've reached chapter eight. So they don't get counted as good. Chapter seven, two out of six. Chapter eight, three out of 14. Chapter nine, four out of 18, but one is a repeat star pendant, so three out of 18. Chapter 10, two out of six. Chapter 11, two out of 10. Chapter 12, zero out of three. Chapter 13, one out of one. Hey, that's a perfect 100% right there. Chapter 14, there are no chests. Chapter 15, two out of nine. Chapter 16, two out of 12. Chapter 17, six out of 20, but one is a second enfeeblement ring, yay. And two others you will receive soon as unmissable prizes for defeating bosses, so three out of 20. Chapter 17 is the final dungeon in the game, the drum. Three items of value to be found in chests out of 20 chests. I bet you're thinking that I'm making a mountain out of a Belgian waffle that I'm blowing this way out of proportion. But let me make a comparison. I know I said that every JRPG gets chests wrong, but actually I can remember one that got it mostly right. Let's compare the final dungeon of FF7 Remake to the final dungeon of Eternal Sonata on the PS3, Double Reed Tower. The drum, three out of 20. Double Reed Tower, seven out of eight. Knowing nothing more than the chest contents, which dungeon would you rather explore? The one where nearly every chest contains an equipment upgrade 
or the one where nearly every chest contains a healing item. Double Reed Tower also has four boss battles that each drop an equipment upgrade, and none of those items are the same as the ones you can get from treasure chests. It would be nice if the most famous JRPG company in the entire world with the highest budget JRPGs in the entire world would afford its employees some time to play someone else's JRPGs and do some research. That's 27 out of 149 chests in the entire game that are worth a damn. That's 102 pointless collectibles that are masquerading as worthwhile exploration rewards. Get out of here with this time-wasting filler content. My proposal for fixing this problem is exactly what you're thinking. Simply don't make those 122 chests. If you have a few chests placed in a more challenging or easy to miss way that all contain equipment, people will be more satisfied upon finding them. When players realize that all the chests in the game are going to be of this level of quality, they will want to leave no stone unturned to find them all. This is better than being able to write, quote, explore vast dungeons full of treasures to be discovered on the back of the box. There is a lot of wasted potential when it comes to exploration in this game. There are multiple moments where the game tells you what to do, but doesn't leave it up to you to actually do it. Instances like these could actually be made more challenging, more engaging, and often require less money and effort to make. Win goddamn win, right? Examples. In the Kids on Patrol quest, a lady asks you to find five kids, and she goes out of her way to let you know that you can identify them by the wooden swords on their backs. But you don't have to look for the swords to identify them because a green marker appears over each of their heads. Just don't add the markers, brah. In the train tunnel, they tell you to find the way by finding graffiti of Stamp the Dog and going in the direction the dog is facing. But every time you get near one, they have a cutscene about it. Just leave it up to the player so they can feel like they found their way on their own. The level's already 100% linear, so you can't get lost anyway. In the Shinra building, hopping across the chandeliers is completely controlled and linear. Why not let us choose which chandeliers we want to jump to and make it a puzzle? Speed up the movement while you're at it. The way it is now, you're just going through the motions and waiting a lot. It might as well have been a cutscene since we hardly have any control. There is a sign in the catwalk dungeon that talks about shutting off the sun lamps. Why not let the player find it, read it, and come to the conclusion that they need to turn off the lamps on their own instead of having everyone gather around to have conversations at every step in the process? That could have been amazing. They put a fence up to block an alternate route to the train station, which would have added replay value and a challenging battle with a ton of guards. Who wouldn't like to do that? The bomb timers don't do anything. They are already exorbitantly long. You cannot run these timers down to zero without standing around and doing nothing. So they were already pointless for gameplay purposes. In chapter one, they make you choose between two times that are both far too lengthy. So choosing is also pointless. But then when the timer reaches zero, you don't die in the explosion. The game just goes on like you escaped unscathed. What the actual fuck, man? Remember when the mayor tells you to find his undercover avalanche informant? You're supposed to find him without blowing his cover, so you need to ask people about the mayor, and the person that replies, he's the best, is the guy you're looking for. Now, did you think that you were supposed to go around asking people about the mayor? The mayor told us to ask people about the mayor, so I thought we were supposed to ask people about the mayor. I'm sure we all thought we were supposed to ask people about the mayor. So why the fuck is there a marker over his head? The whole thing was pointless unless you're counting the comedy value. There is so much wasted potential that results from being cinematic, making the game easy, or just plain bad choices. Miscellaneous Exploration Observations Number 1 
There are many times that you will have to move slowly through tight spaces. It drives some people goddamn crazy. Some of those times, you're ready to go through that space, but the game makes you wait until all of your party members go first. Waiting for things to play out never ends with this game. Number two, the amount of NPCs in the game is staggering. In the first area of chapter two alone, there are 70 NPCs and all but four of them have their own unique dialogue. They're the least important overly mundane lines ever, but it's impressive nonetheless. I wouldn't be surprised if I counted over 200 people in each of the town areas. Number three, there are lots of boxes, chairs, and tables that you can throw all over the place by charging into them or slashing them. And they have physics too. They just might be the best part of the exploration. Number four, when out of battle, you can only do single slashes, no combos. It seems like a negative, but most of the time you can hit all the boxes in an area with a single slash, thanks to the hitbox being far larger than the area the sword actually touches. You can also push the crates so that they're all together. It's designed so that you only need one slash at a time. It's not a flaw. It's fine. Number five. Why do we have to press the triangle button to pick off these spider webs instead of slashing them? It would make way more sense and add a bit of elegance to the slash move. Number six. As you travel, your guys talk. That's a fun addition. Number seven. You can't jump down this stupid ledge, this tiny little ledge. Cloud won't jump it, despite having done this in chapter one. Number eight, in chapter eight, the only way to progress the story is to talk to Oats. This is stupid because Cloud doesn't care about Oats. Oats has nothing to do with Cloud, and there's no way to know that you're supposed to talk with him. You lose control so frequently here that it should have just been one long cutscene. Number nine, it doesn't matter which side of the train tunnel you run through. The trains are programmed to come where you aren't. Boring. I wanted to get hit by a train. Number 10, you have to watch Scarlet on this TV and you have to watch Heidegger on this TV. It should be up to the player whether we watch that stuff. Extremely annoying. Number 11, every time you sit on a bench, it fades to black and then fades back in very slowly. Don't fade to black and just heal my spiky ass. Number 12. The pause menu pops up a little slowly. This would normally mean that you have to wait for it to finish displaying before you can move the cursor and do things in the menu. But in this game, you can actually move the cursor and make selections while the menu is still invisible before it fades in. That's better than not being able to do that but a menu that pops up immediately would have been ideal. The last thing to talk about is the story. I believe that gameplay is far and away more important than story in any game. So I'm only going to point out the two most glaring issues I found with the story. First issue, Sephiroth. Sephiroth. He's one of the most popular characters in all of video games, but his existence alone is a flaw in this game. Starting from chapter two, Sephiroth appears to Cloud either in real life or in hallucinations over and over again, saying things like, that which binds us together would be no more. None of this stuff makes any sense and none of it gets answered because this is only part one of the story. So the whole time new players are thinking, who the fuck is this asshole? Maybe people will be able to piece together just from that one scene that Sephiroth is the one who burned down Cloud's hometown. It seems that Sephiroth killed someone close to Cloud. Who was it? Was it his mother? Maybe it was Tifa because we saw him kill her in the Shinra holodeck thingy. We never find out what happened for sure. Now what about FF7 veterans? What objective observations can they make about this? They could say that his introduction is HORRIBLE! The whole Sephiroth repeatedly appearing to Cloud and saying mysterious things doesn't work. 
The number of appearances is far too many, and every time it's the same thing. Sephiroth appears, Cloud is shocked speechless, Sephiroth says some vague references to their past, and then he's gone again. This unnecessary repetition makes Sephiroth more annoying than fearful. So motivation for old school fans to kill Sephiroth is created entirely by the original FF7. And for new players, the only motivation they have is to not have to watch all these boring hallucinations anymore. The developers took the exact opposite approach to the way they introduced Sephiroth in the original. It was done like the movie Jaws, where they try to make you fear him without even showing him to you. The it's me again approach of the remake is far inferior. When you finally fight Sephiroth at the end of the game, it is utterly pointless. It's just a piece of fan service tacked on to the end of the game because we gotta have the Cloud versus Sephiroth battle. For new players, it's like, why, why do we have to fight Sephiroth? There has been no motivation given beyond getting Sephiroth out of Cloud's head. Sephiroth just pops in from out of nowhere right after another far more lengthy and difficult battle, further reducing the impact of Sephiroth. And fighting Sephiroth here will only reduce the impact and intimidation level of Sephiroth when we actually fight him at the very end of the whole story in FF7 Remake Part 8. I mean, we've beaten him already. We could do it again. The far more massive story problem is the whispers. These swarms of ghosts that look like black garbage bags blowing in the wind have the duty of ensuring that destiny runs its course. These ghosts' first flaw is that they remove agency from the characters and consequences from their action for no other reason than that's not what's supposed to happen. For example, Barrett decides that they don't need Cloud on the next bombing mission. Barrett decided it, and the ghosts removed his agency to make his own decision by forcing him to reverse it. They injure Jesse and make it so that Cloud is required to go on the mission after all. Here, Cloud wants to kill Reno, but the whispers prevent him. And how many times did they get in the way when we were trying to hurry to the pillar to prevent Shinra from dropping the plate? And at the very end, they protect Rude from our attacks, so he has time to finalize the self-destruct sequence. If random ass ghosts are going to control everything, what actions can the characters take that make any difference at all? Seriously, if the ghosts were going to ensure the release of the plate all along, then what the hell was the point of having us watch all those we gotta hurry scenes? If they tried their best and it just wasn't enough, then we've seen the consequences of their decision to blow up two reactors and the struggle between two forces over the plate release mechanism. But destiny wills it, so the previous two bombings don't matter. And the outcome of the pillar battle also doesn't matter because the ghosts were going to make sure that button gets pressed anyway. Second flaw of the ghosts, as if their existence alone completely breaking the story wasn't enough, they aren't even consistent. They can't even perform their sole function. The role of the Whispers is to make sure that the story stays on the course of destiny. Guess what the course of destiny is? It's the event of the original Final Fantasy VII. Pretty meta, huh? It turns out that these ghosts represent Final Fantasy VII purists who don't want there to be any changes to the original story in this remake. They always appear when something different from the original starts happening. I was admittedly too stupid to see this and enjoyed having my mind blown when I read about it later. It's too bad that they just do not work! If they're supposed to preserve the events of the original, then why do they allow some things to change? Remember when Cloud goes on a secret mission with Avalanche behind Barrett's back the night before the next super dangerous and important bombing mission? That didn't happen in the original! Where were the ghosts? All they had to do was fly into the exhaust pipes of our motorcycles, and that would have taken care of that. Remember when Cloud fought Reno in the church and Rude in the corral? Those didn't happen either. What about when Wedge fell off the pillar, survived the fall, 
and evacuated the Sector 7 slums just before the plate came down, drastically reducing the number of casualties. He was supposed to die from the fall, you incompetent burnt marshmallows. Third flaw of the whispers. Their functionality is inconsistent. Are the whispers not an extension of the god of destiny? Can they not create exactly the situation they want because they are infinite and have been controlling the destinies of everyone on this planet since the dawn of eternity? Can they not magically bring people back from the dead, make you oversleep, and block the stairs? They do all these things. So why the hell does the accuracy with which they do their job vary so wildly? Sometimes they strictly shuffle you along at the slightest deviation from the original story, and sometimes they just be like, yeah, I'll fix it later. Here are the whispers after the battle with Reno that I wasn't supposed to have, preventing me from killing Reno as I try to kill Reno. Here they are in a mass panic, making sure the only way I can go is up to the roof. So they're intervening before I go the wrong way. Here they are throwing Wedge off a building to kill him after the time he was supposed to die. Well, at least they got around to it eventually. Here they are doing the exact opposite thing they're supposed to be doing. Why are you saving him? He's supposed to die right there. Here they are trying to prevent me walking this way, but we just push past them. So they can just fail sometimes? Can the God of Destiny fail to make Destiny happen? And what's up with the Whisper's strategy here? They need Cloud to go on the next mission. So hundreds of them fight Avalanche until Jessie sprains her ankle. And that will guarantee that Cloud goes on the mission? That's the stupidest plan I've ever heard in my whole goddamn life. Why not just send one Whisper to go inside her and give her a stomach ache? Isn't that scenario more likely to eliminate her from the mission? What if she didn't sprain her ankle? <laughs> As stupid as the sprain her ankle plan sounds, there is actually a much bigger problem with this scenario. <clears throat> Arbiters of fate, you arbitrated the wrong fate. She came on the mission in the original. She was supposed to be there. She was supposed to tell us why our IDs didn't pass the ID checkpoint. But you fucked it up, man. The whispers only have one function and they can't consistently execute it. Thank God we kill God, the destiny God, and won't have to see these things in part two. Fourth flaw of the whispers. You have to kill the destiny God. I can't believe the words that's coming out of my mouth. Why are we fighting destiny itself in Final Fantasy VII? Gameplay-wise, this fight works just fine, but from a story analysis perspective, it has a massive flaw. It ruins all the stakes. All of them. The main villain of this story is Sephiroth, I think. I've already mentioned that the fight with Sephiroth in this game will only serve to belittle the final battle with Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 24. The fight with Destiny, however, belittles this fight with Sephiroth and all future fights with him as well. I mean, seriously, after defeating a gigantic manifestation of destiny itself, tiny little Sephiroth floats down to the concrete. Was anybody intimidated by this? The combination of these two fights destroys my ability to suspend disbelief going forward. If Sephiroth ever shows up to torment Cloud again in part two, I'm going to be like, Cloud, don't worry about it. You know you're going to wreck his smug face the next time you fight him. The perceived threat that Sephiroth poses has been obliterated. This game's story would have been so much better without the Whispers and without Sephiroth. Miscellaneous Story Observations Number 1. We have to prove our combat abilities to this random avalanche dude. He's not a martial arts teacher. What's up with that? Number two, Barrett putting all the blame on Shinra and none of it on himself and using that point of view to persuade his Avalanche party members to keep fighting for the cause is a nice bit of character continuity for Barrett. Number three, 
Why Shinra made the plate release mechanism in the first place is a mystery to me. Was he actually planning to drop it on people from the beginning? Why the plate release mechanism is a pillar self-destruct sequence instead of just an unlocking sequence is even more strange. Number four, Rude is actually the least rude. So much in fact that he will prioritize putting Aerith to sleep over attacking her during his boss battle. He also prevents Reno from shooting Tifa even though she is directly interfering in their mission. Number five, the Colosseum is well fleshed out, mostly thanks to the announcers. The flowers are a nice touch too. The small ones say, congratulations Aerith from Florist Watanabe. The big flowers say, from the temporary head of the Cloud fan club, Akila. Number six, the way the characters talk is unusual sometimes. In real life, if you lived in a place where most people are speaking standard English, nearly everyone would say, I gotta go now. And on the rare occasion, someone might say, I gotta bounce. And the guy that says, I gotta bounce, should stand out to you because it's rare and it's not standard English. Would you not feel weird if you ran into four people in a row that say, gotta bounce? In FF7R, this happens. Cloud is a mercenary. The standard word for mercenary is mercenary, but everyone uses the term merc. Nobody uses the word mercenary in the numerous times the subject comes up. That is unnatural. To a lesser degree, the phrase, I'll come with. The normal phrase is, I'll come with you. I'd expect a person here and there to fancy saying, I'll come with, and everybody else to use the standard English. But nope, multiple characters say they'll come with. Same with rep. I don't think anyone ever says the entire word, reputation. Number seven, all the NPC comments at Wall Market when Cloud cross dresses are a great touch. My favorite one is, now she looks like a chick that works out. Number eight, Aerith's quote-unquote shortcut is actually way longer and more dangerous than heading straight through Wall Market. And number nine, Cloud is reminded of a Tifa flashback because he looked at a fan. That is stupid. And it makes no sense because it begs the question, what about all the other fans Cloud has looked at in his life? 